Welcome to the Food Safety Community Webinar Series, sponsored by the Coca-Cola Company and Michigan State University. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Joan Rose, and I'm going to introduce myself here in a moment. And today I'm going to be speaking to you about water quality and your health and why that's important to food safety. Um, my presentation is in four parts. I'll be talking about first water quality and health, what that means, how we define that. I'll be talking about then about the major threats that impact water quality. And um, third, I'll be talking about measuring water quality. And finally, these frameworks that we use uh, to address policy and bringing science together to improve uh, water and our health. So let me introduce myself. I'm a professor here at Michigan State University. Um, I am a co-director of the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment, which is a center which has been funded by Homeland Security and EPA. And I'm a co-director of the Center for Water Sciences, and that is a program here at MSU that, is, that brings scientists from all disciplines together to address water and water quality. Um, I've been studying water quality and public health uh, for, um, well, I guess it's 30 years now, <laughs> a long time. And uh, I have one foot actually in engineering and one foot in public health. And um, I like to bridge those, those two areas. So let's get started. So water, quality, and health. What is the connection? Well, you know, traditionally, we defined water really in terms of drinking water, what, what, we, what we consumed. And throughout history, it has been seen as something that is defined as clean. So what does it look like? That it's not dirty, wholesome, uh, that's good for you. Um, and does not carry contaminants that make you sick. So that you know, seems like a pretty simple definition, but it's not really easy to measure. And of course, there's been an evolution of what we consider safe water um, as we've uh, uh, learned more. Now, I'm a microbiologist, and I'm going to talk to you today about waterborne pathogens. And these are the microbes that make you sick. So there's hundreds of different kinds of pathogens. Uh, the groups that I study um, are called uh, enteric pathogens. They're excreted in the feces of infected people, and then we, uh, the next person gets sick by ingestion. And they have several characteristics. They're usually excreted in very high numbers, high concentrations into the environment. And they're very persistent in the environment, and they're resistant often to some of the water treatment that we use. They have high potency, and what does that mean? It means only just a few. Um, if we're exposed to just a few organisms, uh, that means that they can still make us sick. Um, now, we often think of waterborne diseases just causing diarrhea, but what we know now is that they cause many chronic diseases, and they're zoonotic, and I'm going to define what zoonotic means. And we work primarily in three groups of microbes. That is the bacteria, the viruses, and the parasites, the parasites being those little animals. So let's look at this a little bit more. What is fecal oral? Well, these are diseases that are spread through fecal contamination. As I've already mentioned, they're shed by an infected individual. And the next individual becomes infected through ingestion. Um, and many bacteria and parasites have the capability of moving from animals to humans and from humans to animals. And that's called zoonotic transmission, and that causes disease. And as you can imagine, feces from animals and humans end up in the environment, and they end up in water. And so these fecal-oral pathogens are very uh, easily transmitted through contaminated water. Now let's look at a few more definitions. Um, what is a pathogen? Well, pathogen is a microbial agent that causes disease. As I mentioned, the enteric pathogen starts the infection process in the intestinal tract and is excreted in the feces. And I'm re-emphasizing this because fecal pollution is still uh, one of the biggest causes of water pollution around the world. And then again, we've got these zoonotic pathogens. And interestingly, we have a lot of emerging pathogens, new pathogens that have shown up in humans. Um, and everybody probably knows about influenza. But the same thing happens with these enteric pathogens. They can jump from animals to humans. So we get these emerging contaminants and emerging pathogens. Now, 
Here's a list of some of the organisms we're interested in. And while they cause acute disease, that is after uh, exposure within a few days, you're going to get sick. So anywhere from one day to seven days, you start getting sick. You can have diarrhea, gastrointestinal illness. But many of these pathogens move to other organs, and they cause more severe disease, like encephalitis, meningitis. They can cause respiratory disease. Um, uh, they can cause newborn syndrome, hearing loss. And we now know that they cause these chronic diseases. Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a paralytic uh, syndrome. Hemolytic uremic syndrome, which uh, affects the liver um, uh, and uh, kidneys. Ulcer and stomach cancer, reactive arthritis. Um, even diabetes and myocarditis and uh, obesity. There are some viruses that seem to affect our metabolism and some of the other um, autoimmune uh, reactions. Um, parasites can cause uh, this failure to thrive, lactose intolerant, and this chronic uh, joint pain. Um, toxoplasma, we know in young children, can cause mental retardation, dementia, and seizures. So we're not only concerned with this immediate effect, acute effect that happens in, within one to two days, but we're really concerned about this long-term chronic effect. Now, I'm going to talk about some outbreaks um, that have shaped um, and um, demonstrated some of these emerging um, microbes. Uh, Cryptosporidium is a parasite. One of the largest outbreaks ever documented in the United States occurred in, in Milwaukee uh, in, um, in 1993. And half of that city, that's a pretty large city at the time, it was about 800,000, half of that city was sick. 100 people died from tap water in the United States. So we didn't think that was going to happen. Cattle were blamed because crypto is a zoonotic pathogen. But they also found that there was untreated sewage um, flushing in from the river systems through what we call combined sewer overflows into the lake. And as you can see by this graphic, um, affected the intake of the water plant. And interestingly enough, the water at the time met all Safe Drinking Water Act standards. So you see we had a new contaminant causing a very, very large outbreak, one of the largest, even though we met standards, which meant in the United States we needed to change standards. Now Helicobacter is a bacterium. It's well known now to be associated with ulcers. And what um, we, we have found is that um, around the world, many people are infected with helicobacter and they don't know it. And they don't know it until they start getting some symptoms later on and start developing these ulcers. And they can be treated with antibiotics. And you can see throughout the world that it ranges from 30% in, in North America to as high as 80 and 90% in Africa and South America. And we do think that these uh, bacteria come from untreated water and food, um, and we get exposed through ingestion. We do know that groundwater is a big risk because often in rural communities we use a lot of groundwater and we don't treat it. So we don't monitor it as much, we don't treat it. This is a particular outbreak in Walkerton up in Canada. Um, it's a small little farming community, but it, this caused a huge uh, issue, and Canada changed their laws about groundwater because of this. Can you imagine being in a little small community and 2,000 people are sick? You have seven deaths of children, all in a community where people know each other. There were 30 cases of this HUR, and what that meant is that, that kids were going to have to have kidney transplants later in life. And so this was so dramatic. Uh, I went up to Walkerton, and, and you can't believe how sad it was and they didn't realize that their tap water could cause this kind of a dramatic issue. And this is something we want to avoid in small communities. Small communities are at risk right here in the United States. Um, they use these groundwaters. As I said, they've not monitored well. And there's animal waste and human waste associated with this. So um, this is a big concern. Now, in this particular outbreak, o E. coli 0157, a bacterium, and Campylobacter, both zoonotic bacteria, were associated with this outbreak, which came from cattle manure. One of the other outbreaks we've had is in Putin Bay. This occurred in, in 2005. And both the residents and the visitors got sick. And uh, this outbreak occurred in the summer. <laughs> of course, people are there vacationing. It's a vacation area. And uh, the, the area relies on groundwater, and the groundwater was completely contaminated. And it was a couple of things that happened. It was a rainfall event 
improper waste management um, and, um, and the groundwater, the wind changing the groundwater level, just mixing up the contamination. So you could call it the perfect storm. This was uh, associated with many, many different kinds of organisms, Campylobacter, Giardia. So uh, obviously when sewage is the source, you could have multiple pathogens um, associated with illness. Recently in Arizona, they actually had a cluster of guillain brays um, And this is one of the first documentations of an actual chronic disease outbreak associated with water. Um, it's, it was along the U.S.-Mexico border in Yuma, Arizona. They identified um, a total of 24 cases. And um, this was um, associated with some sur surface water and inadequate treatment. And so the chlorine levels have been increased. And of course, this is, uh, was due to council back during the water system. So we have water quality issues all over the world. We have them right here in our Great Lakes where I live, um, you know, and it's, in, in, it's an ongoing concern. Water quality and safety um, requires due diligence um, and a continual because there's always new contaminants showing up. Um, we've also got um, evidence that uh, pharmaceuticals and other drugs that we flush down our toilets end up in our waterways. And this is widespread. They found them everywhere from the Arctic, you know, to areas that you would think were pristine. So wastewater is moving around the world, is moving around our waters and around the globe. Now, not only pharmaceuticals are we concerned with pharmaceuticals, but we're concerned with nutrients. So nutrients come from wastes and storm waters as well. This is nitrogen and phosphorus, and they're associated with these algal blooms. Here's some dramatic uh, examples of some of these blooms. Um, and some of them are toxic. They cause toxic uh, problems, but they also accumulate pathogens uh, and are a risk for both uh, animals and humans. For example, a bird disease, a Clostridium bird disease, has been associated with these algal blooms. And we're seeing more and more of these blooms uh, and the, uh, throughout the world and our coastlines, and basically we see that our coastlines are degrading and we're having more blooms that are lasting longer. Um, and so these are some of the issues we're dealing with right here in the United States. But of course, globally, they're still dealing with one of the oldest waterborne pathogens ever documented, and that's cholera. Cholera outbreaks are reported at the global level. Here you can see from 2008 to 2011 the number of cases and deaths, um, you know, throughout the world, in Africa, in uh, Asia, in the Middle East. And of course, uh, one of the more dramatic events that has been in, in the news recently is the outbreak in Haiti um, after their um, earthquake and some of the other disasters where it disrupted their water system and they had a lot of people moving. And the thing that was so dramatic about this is that how fast it spread to the community. And you can see these lines down in that right-hand corner. I mean, these, this it went from just a few hundred cases to, to thousands of cases of people sick. And um, just um, a, a terrible, terrible situation. And so this is a disease we've known about for hundreds of years. It's one of the oldest waterborne pathogens. We know how to control it, um, but we still do not have um, the infrastructure in place in, pla in, in areas like Haiti to prevent this uh, devastation to health. And you can see that we decreased cholera and typhoid um, dramatically from the 1900s to the 1940s by adding water treatment. And um, it was engineering technology, filtration, disinfection, sewage treatment, and sewage disinfection. And this um, um, really, by the 1950s, reduced both waterborne cholera and waterborne typhoid, which, again, is an, is an old uh, waterborne disease that plagues the world, um, to uh, zero in most of the developed world. We still have outbreaks, though. I already mentioned a few. But you can see that from the 1920s, this, this uh, bar graph up on the left is from the 1920s. It goes out to the 1980s. And you can see that we started documenting some. It went up uh, in the uh, 40s. Um, and then it started coming down dramatically. And then it started going back up. And you can see that these bar graphs um, in the last decade, 2001 to 2008, 
Um, we only have about 50 outbreaks uh, in that decade period compared to 300 in the from 1970 to 80s. So we have been doing a better job. But 50 outbreaks in that time frame is probably too much because these outbreaks are like the plane crashes for the water industry. These are not just minor little cases. The whole community does not have safe tap water. And that means it affects the food and the food supply and um, food delivery and hospitals and, and restaurants and everything else. And you can see that it's not just uh, some of these fecal oral in the bottom. You can see that um, this is um, uh, evidence of uh, Legionella. So Legionella is one of the few pathogens that grows in our water systems and it causes a respiratory disease. It's not a fecal oral but it is still um, associated with increasing cases of waterborne disease throughout the United States. Now, it's not only our, our tap water, but it's our recreational waters. And here's uh, what's happening in our lakes and rivers from 1985 to 2004. And you can see we've kind of gotten a steady, steady increase of outbreaks. Uh, we had up to 16 in 2007. Um, and um, this is the national reporting, so we're a few years behind, but we, we continue to have these outbreaks associated with lakes. Uh, most of them are associated with lakes. Um, there's a few associated with rivers and a few associated with oceans and springs, and you can see that between 05 and 08, um, there was about 35, a little over 35 outbreaks, and that map shows you kind of where we're documenting these, and you can see that in these Great Lakes states, um, and in the East Coast, we have quite a few um, uh, outbreaks associated with recreational waters. Now, outbreaks are just the tip of the iceberg, right? We know that. These are the big plane crashes, the big events that people are able to document. But there have been three estimates that suggest that waterborne disease is going on all the time at these lower levels, not at the outbreak level, but when you look across the United States, if we don't have safe water, we're still getting about nine, anywhere from, it's estimated, uh, 12 million cases a year of waterborne disease, up to 19 million cases of waterborne disease a year in the United States. So these are the estimates, um, and it comes from both groundwater and surface waters. Globally, water contamination remains one of the biggest issues in terms of economic development, in terms of public health, in terms of safety, childhood um, uh, illness, and, and um, ability to protect the sensitive populations. It's estimated 2 million diarrheal deaths a year around the globe due to unsafe drinking water. Um, we have uh, 780 million estimates and, uh, without access to um, uh, safe uh, water sources and 2.5 billion people that just don't even have a toilet or any kind of sanitation system. Now, the United Nations has developed a global goal, the, the Millennium Development Goal number seven. Target 7.C was to, uh, to have those without access by 2015. And in 2015, we're gonna be developing new goals. Um, and actually in drinking water, they've done a pretty good job globally. They've had a good access to safe water putting in new wells around the world and that type of thing. So access, but they haven't tested the water. So sometimes the water quality is not so good. So that's going to be one of the new goals in the future is actually to test the water. And so they may have access, but we don't know whether the quality is high enough. And so there's still a health issue. Quantity is really well studied, but quality is not. And so most of us spend our career trying to answer this question, how safe is your water? <laughs> That's a very difficult question to answer. And we know that this lack of sanitation throughout the world is a major source of these contaminants. So let's talk about these threats. Well, the fecal contamination, it can be sewage and inadequately treated sewage. It can be septic tanks, combined sewer overflows, storm water runoff, inadequate infrastructure. That's a huge one for most of the world. And even in the United States, our infrastructure is starting to fail, so we're going to have to replace it. Toxic algal blooms and climate change. These are all threats to our water quality, and I'm going to talk about these. Um, consequences, of course, we talked about the waterborne disease, both the outbreaks and the endemic. But we have a lot of boil orders. Every time there's a contamination event in, uh, in uh, tap water, people have to boil their water. That's a cost uh, to the community. 
And there's hundreds of boil orders um, uh, throughout the United States every month. Um, and of course, there's these chronic and acute effects. And in the bottom, you can see this picture of the septic tank. That's an ice sculpture to a septic tank. And um, of course, then the uh, other picture is the combined sewer overflows, which we still have many of these uh, throughout the world, in which untreated sewage and stormwater mixed together are not properly treated and dispersed to the environment. So um, these sewage discharges are uh, associated with these enteric bacteria, parasites, viruses, nutrients that I've already uh, mentioned. Legionella bacteria are influenced and free living amoeba are influenced by temperatures and biofilms that tend to grow. As you get more nutrients, you get more biofilms, you get more enriched waters. So then we get some of these naturally occurring issues, the legionella, the free living amoeba, the toxic algae. Um, and of course we have the toxics, pesticides and pharmaceuticals that people are concerned with. Um, there's agricultural runoff, there's ballast waters are a big concern because of our our transportation, our global transportation system with, with ships. There's people themselves, they overuse areas and you've probably seen some of those pictures where there's hundreds and hundreds of people on a beach. And so we, uh, in, as we urbanize, as our environment is, people want to access the natural environment and these coastlines, uh, these natural resources, we are degrading them by this overuse. Um, here's some pictures. Uh, this is the Great Lakes up here in the left. This is a stormwater runoff. You can see it bringing all this turbidity and mud in and with that comes toxics, nutrients, pathogens. And this is an issue in Florida. It's an issue in, in Washington and so throughout the United States. In the bottom you can see some of the, the um, an obvious uh, discharge of a septic tank right to a water body. It's usually not so obvious. And then of course this became a national issue. This is a cartoon from the Washington Post. Because normally we don't, we don't necessarily know when to close beaches or when to um, close our coastline to people so they're not getting sick. Uh, but when there's an obvious sewage spill, they do close the beaches in most places. So this says, I adore the beauty and the tranquility of those raw sewage days. These are the lifeguards, you know, relaxing on the beach where there's no people because of a sewage spill. <laughs> We in the United States, um, our grade this, uh, in 2012 was a D um, for um, uh, our infrastructure. And that's um, the 1,600,000 owned wastewater plants, hundreds and thousands of pumping stations, 600,000 miles of sanitary sewer, 200,000 miles of storm sewers. Um, it's going to cost us $390 billion over the next uh, 20 years. So we need to do it right. We, when we build these things, they need to last 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years into the future. And we need to understand what that future is going to look like. What is the population going to look like? What's the urban population going to look like? What's going to be happening in agriculture? So we need to really um, understand that as we start to pay for this infrastructure and upgrade of our infrastructure in the United States and even build the infrastructure in the rest of the world. Now, you know, water is part of the global uh, life support system, one of the important <laughs> life support systems because life can exist without good water. And we live now in a human water coupled system. Uh, every aspect of the water cycle is influenced by humans, by whether it's, it's uh, changes in climate, whether it's changes in the way we move water and dams and store water and treat water. And as I've mentioned, animal waste, that that corner is where I work, uh, focusing on drinking water and recreational waters. But we know that um, this connection, there's a, there's a very strong connection between water and our food. And this involves irrigation, fertilization, agricultural runoff, involves both our shellfish and our fish, as well as our produce and our, um, and our protein sources, our animal agriculture. Um, and finally, then, it is coupled to this change in our, um, in our communities, where we have really many more susceptibles uh, than before. Um, uh, we have more elderly. We have more people at home that are immunocompromised. Um, of course, we're always concerned with children and young infants. Um, and so all of these things are influencing this emerging uh, pathogens. Um, and, this, and these connections become very important. So water quality is not just a recreational and a tap water issue. 
It's about our food supply, our food security, um, and it's uh, you know about our um, our protein sources. Um, and, and so, um, because of these zoonotic pathogens, we're concerned with animal health and human health. Now, one example of a recent outbreak um, uh, that has occurred. Uh, just uh, this year is a parasite called Cyclospora. And it um, has affected um, a numerous states across the US. It's from produce that came up from Mexico. Um, Cyclospora is only found in human, this particular species, so we know it came from human waste. And um, it, spread, it was spread uh, to the produce through contaminated water, they believe. Right now, the case count is 643, 25 states. People have been hospitalized, but luckily, no deaths yet. So um, this particular parasite has a very strong connection between water and food, and partly because that little oocyst that you see up in the corner, which is an egg-like structure, uh, survives quite well in the environment, and it matures. It has to mature in the environment. So once it's excreted, it sits there on the produce, matures to an infectious state, and then starts to cause these infections. Now, um, I wanted to mention biofilms because biofilms are something we're learning about, we're trying to control. Biofilms occur any place where there's a surface and water interface. And we try to control them in our pipes. We try to control them in unwanted biofilms in some of our river systems and all of that, and cooling towers, swimming pools. Nobody likes a slimy swimming pool, right? But uh, they are very difficult to control. They harbor things like Legionella, and they harbor things like these free-living amoeba. Now, recently, um, this just happened in September um, 2013, a young child uh, died from a very rare infection, this Negleria phalari amoeba. They believe it's coming from the tap water. Uh, it gets in through the nasal passages, so the kids get the water up their nose. And uh, then the amoeba goes to the brain. And um, uh, unfortunately, it's very unlikely that once the infection starts, uh, that the patient's going to live. And I guess one of the kids got it on a slipping slide. And we're seeing more of these negleria coming in our tap water. We don't know if it's temperature. There's higher temperatures. We're not controlling the biofilms well enough. And there's, you know, we, uh, the, the pipes are older. And so we really need to, um, this is one area where we're really going to have to start focusing on our science, and that is what is in these biofilms, what makes a healthy biofilm, because these are ecosystems, and we do know there's some, the, there's some good biofilms out there. So how do we look at this and, and really um, uh, protect ourselves against some of these pathogens? Climate, I mentioned climate change. Um, this is an example of uh, the outbreaks in the United States over the last 40 years. And every place you see a little pink circle with a dark center um, is where the outbreak was statistically associated with a big rainfall event. And so we know now statistically, scientifically, not just anecdotally, not just from one outbreak, but from numerous outbreaks, that extreme rainfall events, and every indication says we're going to get more of these, is associated with outbreaks uh, in our communities, both groundwater and surface water. And all those little tiny black dots are where we have CSOs and untreated sewage spilling into our water. And you can see that there's a cluster of these outbreaks, at least on the west coast and on the east coast and in the Midwest, um, where these things may be associated. So source, what's the source of the pathogen and how do they get to our drinking water? Obviously, it's um, um, through these rainfall events. And of course, climate's going to affect the developing world even more. And it affects their food supply and their water, so they get a double whammy. Um, this is an example of an outbreak that occurred of cholera in Malawi. And they were dealing with a, with a drought followed by a flood. And so they had a food crisis at the same time they were having a water crisis. And just uh, very, very serious. And of course, it hits the sensitive populations Severely, 40% of our populations are in, in, in um, one of these categories. And of course, most of us in our lifetime are going to go through one of these categories. So we will be more susceptible if we're not already. 
Now, how do we measure water quality? What are we going to do about all these problems? Well, we've used indicators for a long time. These are easy to, to measure bacteria that are related to fecal pollution. They're found in high concentrations, and they're less expensive, and we can sample quickly. And so globally, E. coli, one of the bacteria, is a global indicator of water safety, both for recreational waters and tap waters. And of course, the pathogens on the other side cause the disease. They're usually found in low concentrations, so it's more difficult to monitor for them. They're more expensive, but we do need to understand our pathogens. So those are more diagnostic. We use diagnostic tests to go after the pathogens, and we use these indicator tests for routine monitoring and compliance. So here's some examples. Um, local health departments, states, federal government, uh, academic scientists, they all use um, these tests. Uh, and they are reliable, they're standardized, and they're trusted for making decisions. And as I mentioned, the current standard is based on E. coli. Here's one example with these pictures at the bottom. Just take a glass of water, sort of a 100 mils, sort of a one glass full, uh, filter it through this little white filter, uh, is, which is in the middle panel. We put that on media and auger, what we call media and auger, which supports the uh, membrane and allows the bacteria cells to grow into a colony and we can count them. And so in drinking water, we're, we're not supposed to have any, zero, in 100 mils of this E. coli. But things have changed. Over time, we started with a coliform in 1914. Uh, we moved to fecal coliforms and we still use fecal coliforms in some wastewaters. And then we moved to E. coli in 1986. And now it's the uh, global uh, indicator for drinking water throughout the world. But we now have new approaches and new technology. And this new technology is called polymerase chain reaction. That's one of the new technologies. And what is that? Well, we actually, just like CSI in the, in the show, we take a water sample and we take the DNA out of the bacteria out of that water sample. And then we copy it. So polymerase chain reaction, or PCR for short, is an enzymatic copy machine. And we actually have machines where we can copy that target. And you can see that we get more and more and more and more and more. And in a few hours, we can detect then a pathogen of interest. Um, and so it's highly specific. It's more rapid. And uh, we can use it for a lot of different things. Not, we can use it as a diagnostic tool now to really look at that connection between water quality and health and not just use the indicator system. Now, where has it been used? Where has uh, PCR been used? Well, it's been used in a field called source tracking. Now, I gave you all those sources, right? You saw on that one slide, it could be animal manure, it could be septic tank, sewage, so on and so forth. But if we're going to fix it, we've got to know where the pollution is coming from. So this source tracking field is emerging, and it's emerged in the last 10 years, and now we have standardized methods, and we can um, look at the source. Is it birds? Is it chickens? Is it turkeys? Is it humans? Is it cows? Is it pigs? So we can identify these sources through this microbial source tracking, and that way we can start to fix the problem. We can start to look at what we're doing on the land, where are the priorities, where are the hot spots, how are we going to fix uh, and get rid of the sources that are contaminating <clears throat> our water and leading us towards, um, uh, you know, these waterborne diseases. <clears throat> now, one of the examples um, is that we've looked for this human sewage marker in Michigan. We actually took the whole um, uh, lower uh, part of Michigan, looked at 64 watersheds, and then um, uh, we're able to identify which watersheds had the most impact associated with this human marker. And uh, partly um, our surprise, to our surprise, it was related to septic tanks in these watersheds. So new ordinances around fixing septic tanks, upgrading septic tanks, moving communities onto sewer, and treating the wastewater appropriately um, can move forward with some type of priority using this marker. Now what about the rest of the world? Here's uh, four uh, examples of some monitoring that's going on in Nigeria, Tajikistan, Nicaragua, and Ethiopia. And you can see that the compliance in terms of water is not so good. Tajikistan has the best compliance, about 87%. Um, 
and uh, but you can see in the other places uh, really only anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the time are you going to get safe tap water and what we know is that you drink water every day so if you don't have water safe water 100 percent of the time it's like Russian roulette eventually eventually you're going to take a drink of water that's contaminated and that then is going to cause a rippling effect in terms of disease. Now, um, uh, a um, uh, student right here from MSU School of Public Health uh, was involved in um, looking at water quality in Pueblo Nuevo in Nicaragua. And of course, here you can see that uh, it's a small rural communities like many of these poor communities are. And these are the kinds of infections they had. They had a lot of respiratory infections, water-related diarrhea, parasites, these uh, enteric parasites, and, of course, injuries and pregnant issues. These were the whole list. But they had a lot of diseases, and they had a lot of animals around. So one of the issues was how contaminated was, were their wells. They had two kinds of wells, these rope pump wells and a simple well. You can see that maybe the rope pump well looks maybe like it's a little bit co better covered and uh, compared to the simple well. And in, at University of North Carolina, they have developed, which is now being tested by the World Health Organization, a new simple test for E. coli. So you can use it in the field, you can use it without an incubator, and you can go test the water. So this public health student, uh, Patricia Weiss, went off uh, with the MSU team met some of the scientists there in Nicaragua who have a, a field station, met with the health department, and used these bag tests. Now, what did she find? I'm just going to tell you quickly. 32 wells were sampled. 87% were contaminated with E. coli. So that's pretty high. That means that, that the, the, and the community wanted to know. And the public health uh, clinic there is going to communicate this with the public and try to see what they can do about it. The contamination ranged from something quite low to something quite high. Um, and so this is not acceptable. It wasn't related to the depth of the well. It wasn't related to the elevation of the wells. Uh, but it was related. Oh, you could show that um, there was less contamination in um, the rope pump wells. So is there a potential to, to clean up some of the rope pump, mills, ro rope pump wells and um, uh, you know, uh, improve that. Now, we did a source tracking study there. We actually filtered water, brought DNA back to the United States to another lab. And what we found was that the majority of the source, there was some sources coming from humans, the majority of the sources were coming from animals. Now, this is something that the community can do right away. They can use fences and other ways to keep the animals away from the wells and water their animals in another place and so this is, uh, was information that is useful to the community for making decisions about their health. Now, globally, we're trying to develop policies in which we can put the science together and make good decisions because nobody has very much money these days. Um, we're all trying to figure out how to best spend our dollars. Um, and everybody wants safe water. If you ask someone, do you want safe water, they're going to say yes. So the World Health Organization, EPA, and others have developed a risk framework to um, uh, link with water management strategies and to link with, link with the developing world and their strategy uh, called water safety plans. And basically what it is is we, we can identify these hazards based on sources and land use patterns. We want to understand the exposure where are people getting exposed? How are the contaminants moving? Where are they coming from? And how are people getting exposed to them? What happens when people get, get exposed to these pathogens? What are the outcomes, you know, depending on the population? And we can do that through these mathematical models uh, called dose response. And we have a lot of dose response. So this is a new framework. And in the future, people are going to have to be trained. And this is a new area. Uh, trained um, at the, uh, at the you know, interface between health and medicine and biology and engineering and mathematics so that we can focus on water quality. And so we're going to have to bring math into the things that we do. And that's going to be, uh, 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 and it's fun. Don't be afraid. Math is fun. And it helps us look at safety and decisions um, 
And it really makes sense in terms of when we start taking water samples. It means that we start with the problem, and that means we have to engage stakeholders. This is not something that a scientist comes in and says, I'm going to do this. What it means is that it's a community effort. And those of us that work in water and in food and at these interfaces, we work on teams. We work with multiple disciplines. So we come in with the stakeholders, the community, the people. We, we try to identify the problem, identify the hazards, the exposure pathways. Um, we look at the dose response, the mathematics, look at that risk characterization, what's the uncertainty, and look at risk management options. Of course, this is about the future, right? We want to use this to make future decisions and better decisions about protecting our water quality and our health in the future. We have over 35 pathogens identified, and in fact, we're very happy that CAMRA, the Center for Advancing Microbial Risk Assessment, um, uh, has um, advanced uh, this QMRA wiki so that all these uh, models are available for anybody globally. So they can access this website and globally um, uh, use these models to predict outcome. And basically, we want to know, and at the bottom on that, on that x-axis, that's the contamination level. On the y-axis is how much treatment do we need. And depending on the pathogen, we can say, are we in an acceptable zone or a not acceptable zone? And how much more treatment, water treatment, do we need uh, to protect our water quality? So that's how we use it. We want to use risk analysis to develop, develop good standards and good management strategies, implement engineering approaches that are going to be uh, appropriate uh, for our goals. Interestingly enough, this is being combined with all the new IT and iPads and all these kinds of things. This is a, a, a new program that was uh, developed by an undergraduate and a, and, and, and a scientist uh, here at MSU. Um, they were using Java, and it's a risk tool for beach managers. And basically, it downloads some of the things that we know uh, move the contamination in, to a beach, which is wind, wind speed, wind direction, uh, rainfall, temperature, all the things, all those climate parameters move the pollution. So we can actually develop a very specific model. We can download this in real time. We can add the turbidity, the number of swimmers, um, it's all built into the iPad. Um, it, it calculates the transport of the pathogen. It calculates the probability of infection based on that dose response, based on that mathematics, and it gives you a risk assessment. And you can see whether you're in the green or you're in the red. And this is for one hour, two hours, and three hours of swimming uh, from an adult to a child exposure because children actually swallow more water when they're swimming. You probably know that uh, um, if you have children. Uh, and our nieces and nephews and watch them swim. So this is a tool now that doesn't just say what's, an, what's the indicator doing, which you have to wait 24 hours to get your indicator result. This you can use to try to predict what's happening at your beach and give people guidance about the level of uh, contamination and potential health hazards. Now, our, our, our future goals globally um, are going to be this whole idea of sustainable water security. And water security means access, quantity, quality, affordable, affordable engineering infrastructure that delivers the water. We have to have the water delivered, otherwise we're walking with a pail and a bucket to the river, right? So we have to have it affordable. So we want to achieve that universal access to clean water, not just thinking about the drinking water, but the whole cycle, that sanitation side. There's three goals been identified for the future. That's to restrict global runoff. That is this big rainfall events, these rain and this precipitation that we already know is bringing these contaminants, causing these outbreaks. Limit withdrawals from river basins. That's keep our rivers flowing. Keep them with quantity, good quantity, good quality. And contribute to the health targets of free, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, drinking water that's free of E. coli. So these are big. These seem sim like three simple little goals. These are global, and this means that the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to be spending time trying to um, improve our coastlines, improve our ecosystems, our ecosystem health, our drinking water, 
our recreational waters. And overall, that's going to uh, improve our water, our food safety, our food security, our water security, and our, our, um, um, uh, our well-being. There's eight, pro eight priorities for meeting these future monitoring needs, and one of them is to advance these new monitoring technologies because we need diagnostic tools. We cannot just be doing compliance monitoring. It doesn't give us enough information for the tough decisions we have to make. So how do we get these diagnostic tools out there and useful? And so the recommendations to achieve a global understanding of water quality and safe water is to use these new molecular tools, mobilize the international water quality resources and laboratories. They're all over the world. And we can mobilize those and connect them um, as a network. Build human resources. Human resources are very important, and that means education, right, and, and exchange of knowledge and technology. We need to address the distribution of fecal pollution under different climate regimes at regional scales. It's at the regional level that people need to know, and it would be nice to really start to map water quality so people could get a visual look at what's going on to help, make, to help them make decisions. We need industry leadership, global industries, the food industry, the beverage industry, um, the chemical industry, they work at a global level. Um, and uh, they are um, uh, in places all over the world. And so that leadership is needed. And can we at the university engage with industry leaders um, uh, for this emerging technology? Um, can the industry leaders enhance um, the ability to link to foundations? And can they enhance uh, the government funding um, in different places in the world? And of course, we want to promote health and water safety at the top. And um, this is a global goal. Can this be fashioned after what we've done in other sciences, where we bring science into policy and into translational science, like the Human Microbiome uh, Project? Uh, I think we can do it. We certainly have the capacity, I think, to do it. And we just need the networking and the will. So I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here today and talk about one of my favorite topics in an area I, I'm always getting into hot water in, I suppose. Um, and um, here's to your health and to safe water. Thank you.